What's up guys and welcome back to the channel. We're here at the workshop in front of the Mobile One Mustang and I've only kind of realized that even though we've been doing these vlogs for a very long time, we've done a couple of improvements to the car, we've done some dyno stuff and we've fitted some parts but I've never actually given a full walkthrough of my Mustang drift car. It's got a really interesting story and how I ended up with the car and all that kind of stuff I don't think a lot of people know. So I said on this video I'm going to explain where the car has come from, the history of the car and kind of why I love it and why I have it and what's its purpose. So this car is a 2012 Mustang S197. So that's the model between sort of the car that came back or reignited the Mustang in 05, which was kind of this retro look. They gave it a facelift in 2012, which is this car. And then they went and made the new Mustang in the last couple of years, maybe 2015 or something like that. So this is a strange model because it's sort of in the middle, which makes it quite difficult to buy parts for. But this car was one of the original five or six chassis that was given to Vaughn Gittin Jr. in 2010. So he actually got this chassis before the car was facelifted uh, in, in production. So he got the car and it was never a road car, which is really interesting because I would imagine most drift cars in the world, they started off as a road car. So this one didn't. This was sent as a bare shell. And then uh, we'll go through the, the build breakdown in a little while and I'll show you all the bits and pieces, but it was actually built from a bare shell to be a drift car from the start, which is a very unusual thing for a car. It happens with race cars, but it doesn't really happen with drift cars. So that's quite interesting with this one. So Vaughn had the car. Now, the history of this particular chassis is a little bit, I would say, we don't know because there was five or six of them. One of them won the 2010 Formula Drift Championship. It could have been this chassis, we're not too sure. And I think Vaughn even had a lot of swapping over between cars getting crashed. And because all five or six chassis were identical, some were used as demo cars, some were used as the competition car, and some were sold to clients and people all over the world. So this car, we think, was one of the original ones used in Formula Drift, or it may have at some point, but it was essentially the same chassis that was used in Formula Drift. Then the car was going to Europe, doing demonstrations, things like that. It actually did a really cool video where it had like a flame video that was on the Formula Drift channel quite a bit for Monster Energy. That was the car that was like, this is the actual chassis that was used in that, we do know that. Then uh, Vaughn was in the Middle East doing a demonstration, met up with Danny Neville, who's one of the drivers in our championship, in the Emirates Drift Championship. And at the time he was driving a Cobra Mustang, which was kind of the older version, more of a pro-am car, and he wanted to step things up. So he actually purchased this car from Vaughn. Now at that time, it didn't have the extensive power it has now. It was still sort of on a demo setup, so it had a naturally aspirated 5 liter Boss 302 motor and a kind of a couple of bits. So at that point, the car went to compete in the Middle East. And then, coincidentally, our first event ever in the Middle East, which was Drift UAE back in the day, maybe five or six years ago, we went over there and we actually saw the car for the first time. So I saw the car, it was matte black at the time, Loved the car. It was obviously, you know, I'm a big fan of Vaughn Gint Jr. and everything else that goes with that and was a big fan of the, that car in Formula Drift. And I loved the car, but I never thought anything of it. It was Danny's car, whatever. Fast forward a couple of years and about four or five years later, we return back to the Middle East and we start running what is now called the Emirates Drift Championship. And at that point, the car was still there, but Danny had moved on to a different chassis. He was driving a 180SX, which he still drives today. So this car was sitting there, and we started talking, we started having a conversation. I sort of had a, an, an interesting idea of bringing the car to Ireland, owning the car. It has a very significant history with me, which I kind of skipped by, which is essentially that when I started watching drifting, the first time I ever commentated, which was in 2010, I never understood how competition worked. And I actually turned on a Formula Drift event that was on the weekend before, and this was the actual car that won that event. So the first time I saw a full competition from start to finish, understood it, it was Vaughn in this car. So obviously from my drift career, quite a significant car. So basically then we decided we'd take the car back to Ireland. Now we did a little bit of a part exchange on my old SR20 Corolla, which ended up going to Sultan Al Qasimi, which is now being rebuilt again. But a lot of different cars went a lot of different ways. And then Sultan's car went to Danny and Danny's car came to me and it was very confusing. But in the end, we shipped the car from the Middle East. It was put on a container in Abu Dhabi and it arrived in Dublin port. And when it arrived, it wasn't perfect. We had some sand issues in the fuel system. It wasn't running right. There was a lot of different things that went wrong with it. We had about a week until our first Drift Games bash and we wanted to unveil the car, but we took off the wrap that Danny had on it and took a lot of the paint with it. So we went down to David Coleman and Rick Weldon and we said, hey, we got about a week. We threw all the boys at it and we painted the car matte black and got the car out basically looking matte black with the green stripes to sort of how it looked when, it, when Vaughn had a demonstration car of it. At that point, we then decided will we try and take it to a competition level and from there, the transformation begins. So I think it's easier for me than just standing here talking is to talk through everything we've done on the car since we've taken the car into Ireland, all the little quirks, 
what the stuff does, all the parts that are in it, and what makes it, I think, the highest horsepower drift car in Ireland, because there are cars in Ireland that can run higher horsepower than this, but they don't actually run them on the track like that. This one runs 900 horsepower all day long, which maybe makes it the most consistently high horsepower car. So why is it the most high horsepower car? Well, why don't we just run through the whole car front to back and let you guys see what makes this car so special. So what makes 900 horsepower? Well, the engine in this is a Boss 302, which if you're not like me, big up on your America V8s, you're not too sure what it is, but I've actually done a bit of research into it. So essentially the normal Mustang comes with a GT engine, which is about 412 horsepower. And then they made a special edition of that engine called the Boss 302 or the Roadrunner. And this engine type is actually named the Coyote engine. So they still make the Coyote engine today, but it's the type of way that this V8 delivers its power. It's a little bit different than an LS in the way that its pistons uh, work, but basically this car would have had 412 horsepower as the standard GT. They then made a special edition engine to get more power for it. So as standard in the Boss 302, which this uh, engine is from, it has a forged engine, it has operated camshafts, it has CNC ported heads. So it's essentially built for more power. And then the car made about 444 horsepower. So when the car put a tune, would probably get close to 500 horsepower. And that's how the car was when Danny uh, originally got it from Volgan Jr. But Danny then wanted a little bit more power for it. So we then put on this Vortex supercharger and it's a huge supercharger on this car. It's actually very laggy, which is something that's unusual if you're thinking turbos or superchargers. But from driving the car, you don't get a lot of boost until you're at about 4,000, 4,500 RPM, and then just all hell breaks loose. So it's actually, it's pretty much NA halfway through the rev range, and then all of a sudden your supercharger comes on. And um, this one isn't, uh, as I said, it's quite an old school configuration of V8 and supercharger. It makes a lot of power, it's quite robust. And obviously with this engine, we've run this engine quite a few times not working correctly. So it's actually been pretty good. Compression has been good on the engine and that's because it's forged from the factory. But what was a big problem with this car when we first got it was the electronics. So the electronics were essentially from Ford. So it had sort of like a piggyback Ford performance ECU that well, we were only able to change to a certain extent fuel and air ratio. So it wasn't, for a car running 900 horsepower, it wasn't ideal. So what we did is we got in touch with our guys at Link ECU and said, look, they haven't done a whole lot of these engines before uh, or stuff for them, but we worked with them and we got the entire Link catalog pretty much put in here. So what we did was we took the Link ECU Thunder and ran a ton of sensors. So map sensors, everything. This car runs so many sensors now that has completely transformed it because this is a very old school, robust engine doesn't give a whole lot of information. Now we've got so much information coming from the engine bay that we were able to get very consistent power and make the car work far better than it did. I think we upgraded fuel pressure regulators, we upgraded the pumps, we upgraded everything. So this thing takes a ton of fuel. So we run this car on GT Plus Sunoco fuel, which is about a 105 octane, and it does about seven miles to the gallon, which is pretty crazy. Seven or eight miles to the gallon this car does at the moment. So you can imagine that much fuel, that much air, it's making a whole lot of power, and that's where the 900 horsepower comes from. Up front, as you can see, just before we close up the bonnet, full KW suspension, adjustable the whole way around on the car. We're gonna go into the inside underneath and back, so we'll show you everything there. But under the bonnet, it's quite a simple, pro it's quite a simple car. Big massive V8, loads of boost, and to keep all that from you know blowing pistons into the sky, we've got the Link ECU Thunder making sure that the car is restricted and can't do anything that we don't want it to do. So definitely the best upgrade we've done to it is the Link ECU. It just gives us so much more information and means the car runs safe and reliable and we've had no issues since we put that ECU in. Okay, so inside the car, it's actually, as I mentioned before, it was never a road car. So everything in here is sort of custom and lightweight. So you've got on the dashboard, this is a custom sort of uh, standard dash that's been just adapted. The display is doing all the work now, so we don't need any gauges in the car, everything is shown to me on that. So your revs, your speed, everything to do with, and I'd actually show you a different amount of faults and codes depending on what's happening with the car. And it saved me a couple of times when, you know, something's not running right, it tells you straight away to shut it down. And we put the leak ECU up on the dash just for easy access to all the wiring and everything else is free. We've got Willwood pedals and the gearbox in this car, strangely enough, is actually an LS gearbox. So it's a T6060 um, Chevrolet gearbox in a Ford. We actually didn't know that when we first bought the car. And I actually did a clutch on this car, bought a Ford Mustang clutch, and it turns out that they actually had a, a T6060 gearbox in it, which is a really strong LS gearbox. So it's actually surviving pretty good in the car, which I'm happy with. We've got some Sparkle uh, grid seats in there. Um, I wanted them, the seats that were in there were a little tight for me, so I got these ones measured out, and they're actually really, really comfortable. Sparkle harnesses, 
a full plumbed in fire extinguisher system in there and as you can see the cage and everything was really well done originally from the guys uh, that worked for Vaughn Jr. so that was nothing we needed to change. One interesting thing before we'll uh, move to underneath the car or the back of the car is the entire car has a fiberglass shell so that's really unusual for this shape of car so your wings are fiberglass the only bit of metal left on the car originally on the outside is from this point here to here so that's the only thing that's melt. Roof is fiberglass. This entire rear quarter, as you can see, from here, splits here, and goes the whole way to the back of the car, and all the way down the side, and it's all fiberglass. When we first got the car, there was some issues um, with the car being in the Middle East and in America and never driving in Ireland, which is obviously, it's never driven in the rain before we got it. So one of the most difficult things we had was actually to get a windscreen for it. So this originally came with a Perspex windscreen, and when you would do like a fast run on the track, say in Mondello, the window would actually bow in. And the first time I drove this car was on the runway in Weston, where we hit about 100 and maybe 65 miles an hour in it. And the windscreen was actually touching near the steering wheel. It had actually bent in that much. So that was a little bit dangerous. So we got a new windscreen. When the guy came out to fit the windscreen, he actually uh, couldn't believe what he was fitted into. So we got a new windscreen in there. This wiper is actually from a Renault van. So we couldn't get a wiper uh, mechanism from a Mustang because the actual bulkhead on the car had no uh, place for it because it was never on it. So we actually have to custom fit this kind of agricultural van wiper to the car. But to be fair to Wayne, it actually works at two speeds and works really well. So it's actually really, really cool. The car actually came with no windows at all. And these doors are obviously fiberglass, so it's quite difficult to fit them. So the guys in Group D, uh, Darren McNamara, he actually created this frame for the window, as you can see, a really tidy job. To give the, the problem is a lot of windscreens, if you look at a 180, they're not curved this much. You can see how curved this window is. And that's what makes it really difficult to make a custom window for it because it's actually a really curved uh, piece of glass that's originally there. So that was a bit of a pain. We had to build a full frame all the way down through the door to allow it to have enough strength to curve, all that kind of stuff. So it works pretty good. And the car is pretty lightweight. I mean, it's a heavy chassis and a heavy engine. So the more you can do to, take away a lot of the weight is kind of the best thing. Uh, in terms of styling on the car, these are Ortior wheels. The center caps are long lost. I'm not sure where they are. And um, these were originally arrived to us as Illuminous Green because Danny was sponsored by Monster Energy. We just painted them black just for the time being. We might do a wheel change down the line. Front lip on the car is Ortior. All the body kit stuff is Ortior. And I just changed to a more modern style grille. The new Mustangs have these illuminated lights in sort of triangles on the new Ortiors. The old grille, as you can see, is up there on the wall. So that was two blue lights and sort of an old school grille. So we just freshen it up a little bit with that. And we've obviously wrapped this car. We first had it in matte black, and then we had it in a Mobile One livery, which was sort of a black with camo and all that kind of stuff. And then last year we changed it to this kind of clean and simple white and gray and black look, which to be honest, it's very difficult to design a livery for this car because you know normally in drifting you're looking on the S-bodies or you know Corollas or you know JZX's or whatever. There's not a whole lot of Mustangs competing. Other than that, we move towards the back of the car. We have got a fiberglass spoiler, fiberglass boot lid, everything's fiberglass. But the one thing we did change, which was quite interesting, is the rear lights. So this car came with the original rear Ford lights. Now you're not gonna believe this probably by watching this video, but these are actually fiberglass molds of the rear, the rear lights with stickers on top, which you can actually see the little LEDs in the sticker. And it looks just like a real, and this is actually our brake light here, which actually just runs down into it. So they were a problem because when I first drove the car, I was thinking there's obviously gonna be walls at the event, and each of these were about 650 euro a tail light. So I was like, if I break one, like it's, a, it's, a, it's almost the same as crashing the front of the car. So I was like, right, let's get them molded. So the guys in Megaspec took our original lights and they molded them and then Seamus Walsh and Moose Designs put on the stickers and you wouldn't even be able to tell the difference. If you put them both on the ground, it's very hard to tell the difference. So that was a top job. I'm actually gonna open the bootlid to show you guys what's in here before we go under the car to show you see the underneath. I'm sorry to interrupt this video. I want to give a big shout out to our partners here at Drift Games Link ECU who've been supporting us for many years and also supporting the best drifters and racers in the world with their amazing range of products. If you want to find out the entire range of products they have and how they can improve the performance of your car, check out linkecu.com. As you can see, it's all braced here at the back. Um, as you can see, it's braced out. A couple of little things we added to brace it just out to, the, to make it a little bit more, uh, not as flimsy on the back. It hasn't hit too many walls, but as you can see, there's not much in the back. So if it does, it's all fiberglass. It should just all pop in and pop out. So it's pretty sweet there. 
very functional race battery, um, which, is, which is a bit of a pain to keep charging all the time because we can't trickle charge it, but other than that, it's pretty simple in the back. There's nothing too dramatic. Underneath the car though, that's kind of where it's more interesting. Okay, so we're underneath the Mobile One Mustang now, and I was mentioning this is probably the weakest part of the car. So the car doesn't run independent rear suspension. It runs a live rear axle, which makes it difficult to adjust and also makes it difficult to drive. It's a very old school, robust way of getting the power down. Now it is reliable, but that said, you know, it's not the easiest thing in the world. Both wheels almost move at the same time. And um, now there has been some adjustments made to different suspension geometry here, as you can see at ASD when Volume Junior had it. So there is some adjustability in there. One thing that we had to change, which we actually broke, was the differential. So this is a really, really like high rated Ford Performance differential. It's got carbon discs in it. Um, but I actually smashed it to pieces. I was going to do a burnout in the burnout box at an Irish event and the diff just completely let go. So we ended up putting in a drag diff uh, crown pin and pin, so it's got basically rated for about 1200 horsepower in the car now. So if that breaks, and even Vaughn messaged me saying he never broke one, so I broke one. So he said, if you break that one, just stop drifting, just give up because I don't know what you're doing to the car. So we've got this one, we, we assume it'll be pretty reliable. As you can see with the live axle, the half shafts and stuff are all internal. So it's it's a lot more reliable. It doesn't give us any trouble, but it does mean that you lose a lot of, uh, does mean that you lose a lot of adjustability in the back of the car. As you can see, it's got you know fancy pan rods and uh, it's also got some adjustable, um, anti-roll bars and things like that and the KW suspension as you can see uh, up there is the best of the best so you can adjust it quite well it's not seized it works pretty good it's got a uh, huge wheel with brakes all the way around front and back so it does stop pretty good even though it's quite a heavy car another big thing we changed was obviously in Ireland we've got lots of noise regulations and um, which I was enforcing for a lot of the time so I couldn't be breaking them and the car was running like originally 125 decibels or something like that it was ridiculous so Ryan Morton put this exhaust together which is actually a work of art I'm going to show you guys how much you put in so it's got uh, obviously we've got our four to one manifolds on each side and then you can see here we've added a lot of sensors to the link ecu so lots and lots of sensors kind of going into there's your t6060 as you can see it's pretty crazy you can see the clutch through the side here which is pretty mad which is a bit unusual but as i said that's just uh, an interesting way you can actually get in to have a look at it um, and on here you can see that he's actually left some of the flexi pipes in here so we don't get any cracking and then what we've done is we've run a full exhaust system to the back which is really really nice as you can see here it's joined in the middle it's like a work of art the guys at a uh, vital fabrication have done an amazing job and we ran it up over the axle which was just to keep it a bit of clearance and then into these two huge back boxes so the car now runs about 103 104 well it's definitely under 105 we've tested it a few times in Mandela Park and it's fine so it passes the noise regulations and that's really important too because you don't want to go to a racetrack and not be able to get on the track one of the things that is a big issue on this car is lock on the front as you can see you know this is 2010 when this car was put together and as you can see it's not the fanciest setup i mean this car doesn't get anywhere near the lock of a you know like a wise fab or any of those kits or anything like that it's literally kind of just cut knuckles and to be honest the lock is a big problem the other thing is it has bad ackerman settings because it's not really the two wheels aren't flowing at the same time so i've had real trouble handling the car with that so that's definitely something we want to look at in the future but as you can see that is the reason not very fancy suspension geometry on this car very old school and i think at the moment it's kind of holding the car back in terms of its competitiveness so yeah we've got a little bit of gold wrap here and there around the place just to protect the uh, the body from the heat of the exhaust and other than that it's pretty simple underneath okay so i've given you guys a full tour of the car i really like the car i probably like the car more than on a more sentimental reasons than I do in terms of its performance. Actually, it's quite a difficult car to drive. Steering is electronic, which means it's, you don't get a whole lot of feel through the steering, uh, and you've got the live rear axle. So we took this car to events last year. It was definitely an eye-opener of how difficult it is to drive. The first event we went to with the car was the British Drift Championship at the NEC in Birmingham, and it was absolutely pouring with rain. So it was like 900 horsepower in the rain with a live axle, and it was really difficult. But I did pretty okay, I qualified, I got some battles. We ended up losing to Lewis Mitchell in a really tight battle, which I really enjoyed. We went one more time. And then I was kind of on the fence of whether I would use this or the 180SX for the next couple of competitions. But we brought the car back to Three Sisters and it was really, really difficult as well. A lot of transitions, the car doesn't like to transition, hasn't got a lot of lock, and it has a huge amount of weight every time you transition, so it was really difficult to drive. So I've got a clip here of me driving and qualifying uh, for the British Rift Championship, and I'll show you how sort of panicked you are in the car. So when it hooked up, it was working really well. Once it's steady and, and you're not surprised by anything, it's actually quite okay to drive, but it was really difficult in the battles. So a couple of the ideas we've had for it is to change the supercharger setup to get rid of some of the lag. 
um, that's something that we can do some fabrication on to maybe you know have it come in a little bit sooner, have the power delivery a little bit sooner. Another option, and you know, guys, if you're watching this video, I'd like some advice on this because I'm kind of two minds about it. I'm sure some of you guys watching this are far more technically minded than I am. But there's a couple of options we have. One is we can change the supercharger setup, keep the power at 900 and all that kind of stuff, or we can switch it to a naturally aspirated setup again. Go for maybe 550 horsepower, naturally aspirated, instant torque, instant power, and we still have that original setup for the car. And the other idea is to maybe change it through the regulations. There are some areas where we can change the rear of the car from a live axle to an independent rear suspension. Is it mad to think that maybe we could custom put like an S14 front and rear subframe with wise fab and all that kind of stuff on it and make it actually handle like an S body or a really big heavy S body. That's an option we have as well. So let us know what you think. The one thing we will do is keep it together for the moment as it is because we did a high speed run. We tried to break the Irish land speed record unofficially um, last year. We failed, here's a little shot of it. But we are gonna go back this summer to try and break that. And we have spoken to the guys in Track Day Performance and we did so much wrong when it came to that run. We knew nothing. So now we know exactly what we need to do, how we need to set the car up. We obviously need a warm day, not a, an ice cold day. And we're hoping to break the 200 mile an hour mark or even break just the, the land speed record unofficially if we can. So that's, we're gonna keep it like that for the moment. So that's the next job this car is gonna do. And then when, if we can break that record, maybe we won't, maybe we will. Um, it's gonna be exciting either way. And what I wanna do then after that is I wanna start developing the car for 2021 to see if we can make it competitive and get out on the track and actually compete in it. It's gonna be an interesting journey. I hope you guys are gonna come along for the ride, but what do you think we should do with it? Should we just keep it as it is and use it as a, a bonkers fun car for having fun at track days like the Drift Games Bash? Should I try and make a competition ready? What would you do if it was your car? What would you change? Let us know in the comments below. And thanks for joining me on a little bit of a tour of my Mobile One Mustang. We've done a lot of videos with it, but we haven't really talked through the car. So I thought while we're in this uh, unusual time, we've got a little bit of time, why not talk you guys through it so you're up to speed. So when we do some more stuff with this car, you're already in the know of what's been done before. So thanks for watching. Make sure in the comments let us know what you think of the car you guys might have a little bit more knowledge than me let us know what you think we should change and thank you for watching make sure you subscribe to the channel i think about 60 percent of you guys watching the videos don't subscribe it really helps us out if you guys subscribe hit the notification bell on and thank you for watching and we'll see you on the next one